The following content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It does not constitute means for diagnosis, healthcare advice, nor treatment. Make use of a qualified healthcare professional for such purposes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Charlene Ortiz, and today we are going to continue with our lecture regarding the biological foundations of behavior and their relationship with psychology. As we noted in previous lectures, so if you haven't watched them, they will be listed on the description below if you're watching from home. The previous lectures covered aspects of neurotransmission and also neurotransmitters. And the second lecture covered more specifically the broad and general areas of the brain. So now we are going to continue with more specific areas of the brain in continuation with that second video. So if there are no questions about our previous lecture, let's go ahead and get started with today's continuation. So we were talking about the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now note that the most complex area of your central nervous system is going to be the cerebrum. Also commonly in, in, lay term, in, in layman's terms referred to as the brain, the actual brain. Now the brain is composed of different and specific areas. So the first thing that we're going to discuss is the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex, I want you to think about whenever you get something brand new, you bought something off of Amazon and it has this nice little film on top of it, right? That's what the cerebral cortex is. It's this film, it's this layer on the cerebrum. But unlike a film, a protective film, the cerebral cortex does have cerebral functions. For example, in your cerebral cortex, this is where the most complex mental activities occur. And when we are talking about complex, I want you to think about aspects that are significant, very difficult to conduct. So for example, learning, remembering things, thinking, your consciousness, aspects that are generally considered in other terms as we usually refer to them as higher order functions, right? Usually in, in our field, we refer to them as higher order functions. And higher order, right? Sounds important, right? So really complex aspects. So your cerebral cortex is that which is responsible for those higher order functions. Now, I need you to keep in mind that your brain is indeed divided in different hemispheres, right? Your cerebral hemispheres. Some of you might have heard about being right brain or left brain, and that comes from each hemisphere. For example, you have the right and left halves, in which your cerebrum is separated right down the middle of the brain. There is a longitudinal fissure that is going to descend down the middle. And those fibers that are down the middle in your brain is what we will call the corpus callosum. Now in this specific sense, let's think about the purpose of this specific bundle of fibers. It's a really thick bundle of fibers. Has anyone here had the opportunity to dissect a brain? All right, so one person, just one person. So can you tell us a little bit more about that experience, what it looked like in the middle? Um, it, was a, it was a brain that was given to science, so it's already kind of like dissected. Yeah. And we got to like pull it apart kind of, and it was, it was really slimy. It was really what, I'm sorry? Really like slimy. Maybe let's put it down the middle to see 
It looks like hamburger meat, like it's. It looks like it looks a little bit. Was it human? You were lucky, <laughs> right? It's usually really difficult to have the opportunity to dissect a a, a human brain. So as our friend was mentioning, what's her name? Sarah. Sarah. So as Dr. Sarah was mentioning, when we have a brain, when we split it down the middle so we can see the different hemispheres, I'll try to pull up an image about that. So if you're a little queasy, I highly recommend do not look, look away, look down the floor, look up the seal. So I know some people didn't sign up for this. Like, I want to see that. It's too early. I still have breakfast. Like, I want to see that right now. But we shall. So please don't look if you don't want to. So when it comes to the brain, you will see, well, this one's not healthy. Let's find a healthy brain. So whenever we split a brain down the middle, you'll notice that there is a extensive thick fiber down the middle. And this is the corpus callosum. And what it's going to do, it's going to provide with that connection between the hemispheres. So let me pull up this image right here. Share the screen. So this structure here is what I am referring to the corpus callosum. Notice that it's a very thick fibrous membrane that is going to connect each side of your hemispheres. Why do we need that type of connection? We need that type of we need that type of connection because unfortunately some people have the misconception that our brain is split in the sense that no two sides communicate with each other. But notice that that structure down here in the middle is that bridge that connects, that will connect one side of the hemisphere to the other. It allows for that cross communication between both sides of your brain. And luckily we're going to see an experiment today, a case study, as you know, we've talked about case studies before. And today you're going to see hopefully an experiment in which we have found individuals who have indeed been split down the middle in which either surgically, generally surgically, they have been literally split down the middle. So both sides are in the brain of that person's brain is not connected. Any questions about that? The corpus callosum is that thick band, or is it also the fibers on each side? It's it's the entire thing. So you have that thick band that then extrapolates, feeds into the hemispheres. Now remember that the cerebrum it's complex. Therefore, it has specialized areas that we like to call the lobes, and we're going to cover those four lobes today. The first one that we're going to talk about is the occipital lobe. Now, that occipital lobe is the area of your brain. And I want you to imagine, right? Not that hopefully you don't want to dissect your, you Dr. Shars here brain. I want you to imagine the back side of your brain. This far, back part here, this back part here is that occipital lobe. This part here is in charge of the interpretation of images. So if you take nothing else, the occipital lobe deals with the eyes. How can you remember that? Occipital oculus eyes, right? That's how I like to remember it. I never forget it, right? Oculus means eye. Got it, occipital. So that part of your brain is in charge of understanding and processing those visual, that visual stimuli that you are engaged in, which is why generally we say you don't really see with your eyes, you really see with your brain. In a similar fashion, we also have our next lobe. And in this lobe, 
commonly referred to as the heritol low. Heritol low. Now, something that I like to think about the perietal low, perietal low is that think about this section of your brain, right? So this is the occipital, back of your brain. The heritol low, lobe, I should say, is in charge of that registration, that processing of the sense touch. So again, do we feel with our skin or do we feel with our brains? Now, something immensely interesting is that now we're going to move towards the temporal lobe. Oral lobe. That is this section here. This section here. Oral lobe. And notice that interestingly, your oral lobe is really close to what? Your, your ear. So take a wild guess what's it in charge of, right? In processing the auditory information processing that sensory information coming from auditory processing. So pretty easy stuff to remember. Occipital sounds like oculus, means it processes anything related to the eye. Parietal lobe is going to be in charge of that sensory information, right? Things that we can feel in our skin. And temporal, well, it's right here. It's really close to my ear. So I'm going to assume that it is related to that. It's a really good and easy way to remember that later on in life or for your exam. This is where, to me, things get really interesting. Is the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe. Now, in a very basic sense, your frontal lobe, which, of course, is that very front part of your brain, very front part, right here. This is the area in which the control of muscle movement is involved. Now, the, the, is, the instance why I like the frontal lobe best, and we will cover that uh, somewhat in detail. Of course, it'll be a little bit outside of the scope for an intro class, but we will cover it a little bit. The frontal lobe is what I like to call what makes us human, what makes us rational, what makes us a little different from other species. I like to refer to it in that way because in this sense, all of our higher processing, so for example, rational thinking, analytical thinking, right, things of that nature, right? The reason why most of you are engineers, right? Think about that rational and analytical thinking is highly involved. Your frontal lobe is highly involved in that process, right? So, you know, if we try to give a, a blueprint to a squirrel, I'm not pretty sure if the squirrel would have that frontal lobe capacity to understand. But I'm sure if I gave that to one of you guys, you will have enough of the frontal lobe capacity to do analytical thinking, rational thinking, forward thinking, planning. Those types of logical functions are highly involved in that prefrontal lobe. In regards, so we're going to move a little bit more specifically, unless there are any questions about this. There's a prefrontal cortex. Frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex are those same things, or is that? It's more specialized, cortex? right? So think about, let's say, well, that's not a good brand. BMW, I drove. So think about BMW, but now we're thinking about the models, so like XI, whatever. So you're being more specific about a specific part of the problem. Interestingly, that aspect, that specific part, of the prefrontal cortex 
It's also involved in decisions and self-control. That's why I like to think about like another animal, right? So I like to compare us, our frontal lobe and our prefrontal cortex. I like to think about us and compare ourselves to an animal. You know, if, uh, if I was busy, you know, at home, I have, I have two dogs, I have a beautiful, handsome poodle, poodle a poodle, and I have a really, really ugly, ugly, tiny, tiny dog. I love them to death. A really handsome boy and a really ugly girl. But if I were busy at home, they might not necessarily have those processes. I'm like, oh, she's busy. I'll come back to her later. They have that analytical thinking where ask a human being could see that. It's like, oh, she's busy. Well, she'll, the human would have that logical process. Notice that's actually not mentioned in your book. But for most of you, who here is under 25? Vast majority. I hate to tell you, but your brain is not grown yet. You're not fully developed yet, particularly that frontal cortex, which is why we don't prosecute minors in the same way as we do adults. Why? Because this frontal cortex is not yet developed. As I mentioned, it's involved in decision-making, in self-control, in analytical thinking. So, say for instance, fundamental note in our state, at what age do you think you can be prosecuted as an adult? You can tell me. That's just a little fun note. 13, who says 13? 14, as an adult. Okay, one person. 15, 18, vast majority. 19, 14 is the correct answer. You can be prosecuted as a legal adult at the age of 14 if you are committing a capital offense, kidnapping, murder, Great university, things like that, sodomy. A little fact. But generally, we don't prosecute those individuals in the same fashion because their frontal lobe is, is not yet developed. So that forward thinking, thinking about the consequences of their crime, thinking about the long-term consequences of their behavior, you literally do not have that mental capacity to foresee those issues. Generally, that process stops at the age of 25, 26. Apparently, females develop it a little bit faster, but in a general sense, the age of 25, which is why we don't prosecute minors in the same fashion. Fun little fact 14, 14 years old. You won't be prosecuted the same way. You will be prosecuted as a juvenile. So, for example, um, of course, I'm not an attorney. I'm not offering legal advice. Um, but generally, if an individual of that age were to commit such crime, it could be put on the table that they could be tried as an adult, which means that, for example, in during prosecution, it would be a different court, therefore, more severe punishment. So, for example, in a minor court, uh, you are given the chance of parole, but if you are um, prosecuted as an adult, you may have life without parole or death sentence. So the, the processing is different. And actually, it was declared unconstitutional to sentence a juvenile to life without parole. And that happened because the case in Alabama. What? So because of age, I think he was 15, 16. He murdered like two people or something like that. He was prosecuted as an adult life without parole. And he brought it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided this is unusual and cruel punishment to sentence a minor to no parole. Um, so thanks to the state of Alabama, it is unconstitutional to try people like that. But that's for a forensic psychology class. Yes, ma'am. Um, if the frontal lobes aren't done developing, then why is it like legally allowed to drink at 21? And not even just America, like in Europe, you can drink at like 18 or 16 and stuff. So right. why do we, is it just to beat the bullet because people are gonna do it anyway? So you're talking about legislation of allowing people to drink until the age of 21? Right. So you're saying maybe 25? Yeah, because haven't there been studies proven that the alcohol can be detrimental to brain development? I think a lot of your peers disagree with that statement. Everyone's like, I mean, you know, kind of like a needle. You know, like, oh, that hurt. I mean, like, I'm just saying from like an adult standpoint, if you're looking at a younger child and, you, and you've already waited 21 years, 
at that point, it didn't say for you to make more cognitive decisions. Why not just keep it at 25? Now, I'm going to say this. Dr. Charles is like saying, go ahead and get hammered. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. Don't drink kids. Don't do it. Don't do it. I don't want to like, you guys talk to my boss. Hey, that was it. Check out what Dr. Sean said. She said, do it. Right? But I'll play devil's advocate for this. This is outside of my scope, of course. But if I should wait for you to make a serious decision of drinking, well, so that means I should push the age when you buy a house, the age when you can file taxes, the age that you can um, enlist in the military, a, a, a serious, seriously dangerous job or become a police officer. So we can make that same argument for everything. And of course, it will be outside of my scope. Um, but it's something to think about, huh? So if we push that age to 25, should that mean that any of uh, getting married 25, right? That's a serious decision. Well, not even like driving car. A lot of places don't think that you should be 16 and be allowed to drive car. Like in Europe, I think you have to be 18. But you can so drink at 16 in a couple countries legally, right? In Europe. I know some countries in Latin America, you can drink legally at 18. So the argument is if you can serve in the military, you can drink. So that's their argument. If you're old enough to work, you're old enough to play. That's their argument. Dr. Shar didn't say that. Okay. I didn't say that. Right. I don't want that to be misconstrued in any way. So if, if your three front cortex isn't is finished until 24, 25, does that also mean that you could be probably a minor up until 24? Yeah, you, it could be. So the question was, and as you guys know, my specialty is forensic psychology. So say, for example, if someone can show that, for example, you're 25 and you had what it's legally called diminished capacity for whatever reason. Brain's not developed, you had some history of trauma. Um, let's see, what else? Generally, history of trauma, uh, abuse, diminished capacity because of a mental illness, diminished capacity because of a learning disability. That is brought up in court. So your sentence, remember, that's not the psychologist or the actor witness job that is the judge's job he's the one an expert witness can say this guy has a severe learning disability which would have impacted his decision making in taking this person's life but that is ultimately the, the judge's decision to see okay this this has diminished the responsibility to the degree that i will impart a lesser sentence so that is always the judge's uh, you're also saying that, that there are people that exist with without trauma no, 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 no. I mean, like... Well, you say like that, that it depends on, like, if there's a history of trauma. So. Right. So, for example, the other thing to keep in mind is that Not in a legal sense, security. so in a legal sense, whenever we're trying to use a... Whatever we're trying to use a not guilty by reason of insanity, for example, it's not that you have a mental illness, therefore you're not criminally responsible. It's that you have a mental illness that directly cost of crime. Okay. It's not the same thing. That's why when some people watch a, uh, I don't know, say we have this 19 year old who's schizophrenic and committed a crime. It's like, but he's schizophrenic. He shouldn't be facing that crime. Well, at some point it was determined that the schizophrenia did not directly influence the crime. Therefore, it has no, no credence for the proceeding. Does that make sense? So it has to be directly related to that or what happened. So if it's not, then it's not. And ultimately, the, the individual does not make that decision. The expert witness, the defense, nobody makes that decision. The person that makes that decision, yes, it's what's related, is the, is the judge. A lot of people think, well, the uh, expert witness testifies so-and-so. They're just the subject matter expert. Right. Pretty interesting. I love forensic psychology. You guys can keep me, uh, ooh, you keep me going on that all day. Now, in talking about that and talking about, say, for example, diminished responsibility and trauma, for example, this person suffered, and I hear that a lot, this person suffered a car accident, and since they suffer a car accident, they've been immensely angry, and therefore, that's what led to the crime, right? That's what plasticity, where plasticity of the brain comes into play. Now, when we talk about plasticity, we are talking about the ability of the brain to mold, to 
with that. Say, for example, an injury, and in this case, experience. Okay? Experience can also sculpt and change features of your brain structure. And sometimes you'll hear that in some cases, like Betty suffered a car accident, and ever since then, she's not the same. And therefore, that's why she's being charged with XYZ crime. Now, there's different types of damage that we can have. So for example, there could be a damage in the incoming sensory pathways. And in this specific regard, we are talking about an issue that could have to neural and could involve neural reorganization. What do I mean by that? Interestingly, Say, for example, you suffer some severe trauma, car accident, those of you who play sports, right? You suffer trauma um, to your brain. The brain has the ability, basically the ability, change the structure, and that brain can start generating new neurons. And generating new neurons is the process that we call neurogenesis. Historically, actually, we used to believe a long time ago that this wasn't possible. Once it was gone, it's gone, right? But some forms of damage, depending of the extent of that severity, your brain does have enough plasticity to, well, it can adjust those aspects, right? So for example, if you have an issue with seeing, those connections, those pathways can be readjusted and reorganized through neurogenesis and be, say, allocated to hearing. Well, maybe the person can see really well, but they can't hear really well. It's funny because I met this therapist who was blind. And you're thinking, well, that's a really hard job to do if you're blind because I need to be able to see the person. I need to be able to ascertain whether or not there's some movement, some responses. But interestingly, in thinking about brain plasticity, she's a therapist that cannot see. So I remember my boss asking, so how is it that you ascertain those cues from that client or that patient? And she said that she has had the ability of notice those change and in inflection in somebody's voice. So she has actually, the plasticity, developed this method in which she can see, see those cues through the different sounds and pitch that that client or that patient may have. We used to believe that our brain was hardwired, that our brain was immensely, once it's there, it's there. So if it's damaged, it is lost, but quite the contrary. Our brain is flexible, has plasticity. However, there's only so much damage you can do. There's only so much damage that can be addressed. Right? There's only so much damage that can be addressed. Any questions about brain plasticity? Any questions about that? So, in keeping with the hemispheres, there is a process that we like to call split brain surgery. And that is exactly what it sounds like. We're going to split your brain down the middle. Some people, however, are naturally born like that. You may be like that and not even know it, all right? Some people are naturally, they were born already without that connection between the hemispheres, with that connection within the corpus callosum. But we can physically conduct that lesion. We can actually cause that trauma and split and cut down the corpus callosum. Generally, this is done in cases where we have severe epilepsy. 
So where medication and other methods have failed, we will conduct surgery in which we are going to cut that corpus callosum. And now our brain is split down the middle. Why is this surgery? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? We'll see that. We'll see some of the effects. Now, something to keep in mind, the question was, does it, cause, does it cause significant effects, right? And it does, right? Keep in mind that generally, bona fide, well-intentioned uh, practitioners, whether it be medical practitioners or mental health practitioners, generally when a treatment is imparted, whether it be therapeutic or medical, generally that person has determined that the side effects are less than the benefit that comes from that treatment, i.e. medication, surgery, therapeutic approach. Or, yes, there are some side effects and it impacts communication. Some issues with language are, in, are become a little bit more difficult and we'll actually see the, one of the original examples or one of the earliest, I should say, examples of such. Now, we used to believe, we talked about the occipital lobe, right? And we talked about the lobes that are in charge of both hearing and seeing. But if you remember, you know, I talked about, you know, the back parts, the middle parts, the lower part. But something we need to remember, if you remember anything from my previous lecture, is that I mentioned that no, not one type, right? There's not one specific part of your brain that solely does something, right? There's always an interconnection, right? You're always using your entire brain in order to process whatever stimuli you're doing, right? Therefore, we understand that that connection is necessary, right? That connection is necessary in order to produce, for example, language. We're actually going to see a pretty neat example about that. We are, when we are talking about the hemispheres, think about the specialization of each area. Specialization of each area. Now, each hemisphere, of course, will have those primary connections from the opposite side, right? And what does that mean, right? That sounds pretty bizarre. So if you can see in this image, whatever information, right? So these are your, your so I want you to think, these are your eyes. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at your eyes. This is where your eyes are. This is the back of your neck, okay? Back of your neck. So in the right side, whatever is on your right hand, this is your right hand, this is your left hand. Whatever information you are receiving, that stimuli that you're receiving from the right, is going to be processed through the left hemisphere. And whatever information you are receiving from the left side is going to be processed through the right hemisphere. Right. We have that interconnection because, as I mentioned, each area of the brain needs to be specialized, and we need that type. We need to involve both hemispheres, right? We need to involve both hemispheres in order to process information. Why is that? Well, first of all, because we have our left hemisphere. Generally, our left hemisphere is involved in verbal processing, language, speech, reading, writing, anything involving language. Right? So a good way to remember that, left hemisphere starts with an L. What else starts with an L? Language, right? So it's a good way to remember that, right? A right hemisphere involves many of those processing, that processing that is nonverbal. So visual recognition tasks, generally, um, well, I'll take that back. Now, in this case, the perception of emotions is usually better and processed through the right hemisphere. 
So for example, uh, some people would say, oh, I'm right brain or I'm left brain, I'm very analytical. Or some people will say, well, I'm, very, I'm a very empathetic person. Notice that, sure, you can have some sort of dominance, if you will, but I wouldn't call it immensely significant because you still need to use both sides of the brain, right? So I wouldn't say, oh, sure, you can just ignore the fact that they are connected, right? Unless you had split brain surgery, in which case they're not connected. So I'm going to show you an example of a split brain individual. I'm going to give you some information about that before we get started. So in the case of a person who was either born without that connection down the middle of their brain, or a person who unfortunately has suffered severe, not, severe enough, I should say, epilepsy, in which we've had to conduct that split brain surgery. What happens is that, as I mentioned, it's going to affect language to answer our, our friend's question, question, and that spatial recognition, our ability to report what we are seeing on different sides of our brain. Because remember, if it's on the right side, my right, your left is going to be processed on my left, your right. And if it's processed on your left, on my left, your right, it's going to be processed on my right, your left, right? So it's always that crossing inside your brain. Interestingly, in this specific case, what's going to occur is whenever we have a split brain patient and the questions, and we show them images, for example, of a pencil, a cow, any sort of image on that right side, that person will be able to name that object. So if you remember, if it's on the right, it's processed on the left. And left hemisphere is what? Language, right? So that person is able, whatever they see on the right side, they're going to be able to state that information. Yeah, I see a cow. I see a pencil. Interestingly, when the same image is processed through their left side, they are unable, they're unable to verbally state what it is that they saw. However, they can draw it every day. So I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. Now, this study, in this specific case, it's actually a video from one of the first researchers, or one of the main researchers that conducted this study. Let's make that a little bit louder. What are you guys saying? That. Information from each side of the body goes to the opposite side of the brain. And many functions are performed half on one side, half on the other. But certain tasks are committed much more to one hemisphere, especially in human beings. The right hemisphere is specialized for spatial judgments, while the left can describe its perceptions in words. Normally, these two specialized halves work together as one. I know the left hemisphere and right hemisphere now are working independent of each other, but you don't notice it. Now, you just kind of adapt to it. It doesn't, you don't have any feeling, it doesn't feel any different than it did before. The corpus callosum a huge bundle of fibers connects the two halves of the brain. When it's damaged, in Joe's case through surgery to relieve epilepsy, then it almost seems that there are two separate people sharing a single head. What we can do is play tricks by putting information into his dis disconnected, mute, non-talking right hemisphere and watch it produce behaviors. And out of that, we can really see that there is, in fact, uh, a reason to believe that there's all kinds of complex processes going on outside of his conscious awareness of his left half brain. Joe, I'm going to show you some things. I just want you to tell me what you see. And here we go. You ready? Look right at the dot. Okay. Right. Okay, you ready? Look right at the dot. 
grapes. Good. When Jill focuses on a point, Credit to die. everything to the right of the point goes to his left brain, the dominant hemisphere for language and speech. Credit to die. So we can see here that when we flash a word or a picture, Three. Joe Three. is easily able to name Credit it. Here we go. Let's see it. Close your eyes and let your left hand do a little work here. Okay, what do you got there? Pan. Okay, very good. Now, when a word or a picture falls to the left of a fixation point, that information goes to his disconnected right half brain. And as we can see here, Joe is unable to name it. Joe is able to draw the picture with his left hand, the left hand getting its major control from the right half brain. What did you draw? Okay. What did you see? Wheel. One side, I don't know where I saw another. So even though he can't name it, his left hand is able to draw out the picture right. of the stimulus of the picture or word that right. we presented to his right half brain. What did you see? Oh, him. So just close your eyes and draw with your left hand. Just let it go. Nice, what's that? Saw. Yeah. What'd you see? Hammer. What'd you draw that for? I don't know. What Joe and patients like him, and there are many of them, teaches us is that the mind is made up of a constellation of independent, semi-independent uh, agents. And that these agents, these processes can carry on a vast number of activities outside of our conscious awareness. Even though that goes on, there's some final stage or some final system, which I happen to think is in the left hemisphere, that pulls this, all of this information together into a theory. It has to generate a theory to explain all of, this, all of these independent elements. And, so, uh, and, and, and that theory becomes our particular theory of ourself and of the world. From impulses leaving the eyes, to a theory of ourself and the world. We're beginning to learn how the cerebral cortex gives us our understanding. Francis Crick, famous for his contributions to molecular biology, is now fascinated with perception and with the relationship between brains. All right. So as you can see, in the case of patient Joe, had um, this neural sciences, which, by the way, if you are interested in the biological aspects of behavior, as we've been discussing here in class, that is a field of psychology. Uh, it's a, a PhD in neuroscience, and basically they do this every day. I deal with the aspects of how the central and peripheral nervous system impact behavior assessment, things of that nature. Any questions about the case of this gentleman in which when presenting images on, the, on his right hemisphere, he was able to list them because the information is processed on the left side of the brain, which is in charge of language. However, when that information was presented on his left side, in which means that the right hemisphere will have that involvement, he was unable to verbally state it, but he was able to draw it. So any questions about that? How do we know he's not taking it? It's, we have done corroboration with other uh, yeah. individuals. So, video, video. right, right. So we have conducted several studies of it before. And because we already know how the brain works specifically beforehand, say for example, through MRIs, we can see the same response. So for example, we can see that the person, when they are trying to process that image, we don't have both areas lighting up. We will have just the one area. So that would substantiate this claim. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, um, she or split brain people, are they like aware of the right side? Uh, basically, my mind's like, well, whichever side they can't 
talk about? Are they still like aware of it, but just kind of can't verbalize it, or do, are they just like not conscious of it at all? What happens is the brain will compensate, which is the case of this chapter, right? So, for example, just like the example that I gave you about that therapist who can't see, but she compensated that lack of not being able to identify cues visually. She was able to identify cues through a auditory sense. In his sense, he's able to compensate for both. And the thing is, during that process, it's, it's seamless. Apparently to the person, it's unconscious. They don't realize that that's actually happening. So to them, it doesn't feel any different than before the surgery. To them, it just feels like it's just natural now. I like to think about it as... Think about persons who have suffered an injury, right? A, a, a muscle skeletal injury. So some people learn to adapt to their new injury to the point that it's they conduct the same movements seamlessly, seemingly without no issues whatsoever. And that's what happens with these patients. These processes are formed without them even noticing. I mean, like not just you know moving your eyes, so that you can give it both. Uh, I mean, like, kind of, I don't know what the words were, but like the difference between understanding and being able to verbalize that understanding or communicate it. Like, so without adapting, is it basically they understand but can't verbalize, right. or is it um, that they just can't even, they just don't see it at all? It's no, they can't understand. This It's not a problem of understanding, it's a matter of that inability of trying to put both layers together to see that image and verbalize it, right? So let's see, what's a good example? Think about if right now, you know, God forbid, and you have an accident and you can't see, right? They're one of your eyes. So remember that information that you're receiving from both eyes, right? It's going to develop that peripheral vision, right? But now that you can't see the one eye, this eye is going to attempt to compensate for that lack of that perception. And this process is going to occur without your knowledge. Your eye is going to conduct that process because of plasticity, right? So now you're going to compensate for that lack of connection between both eyes, just like it would for your brain, not having that connection between both hemispheres. Does that make sense? So basically, you just get better at running that understanding of words. So he's but uh, the Joe is complete. Like when he saw the uh, the hammer on one side and the saw on the left, he's consciously he's unaware that he saw the saw. No, he's, he knows he saw the saw, but the process through which he, he just compensates, right, correct. He can't see it. Notice that there's not damage to that occipital lobe. So he can't see it. It's a well, matter I of trying to. Sees it, right. Is he aware that he saw it? Yes. How do we know that? Because I can't say it, but I can draw it, right? So I can tell you, but I can't draw you, draw that. Well, then the, uh, I forgot the doctor's name. He asked him why he really saw it. Joseph responded that he wasn't sure why he really So notice that I can say, consciously, I can say I'm not aware of a situation, but notice that you are indeed aware. It's just you're not being able to manifest it. Now, that's a little bit Freudian of that sense. But if I say, I don't know exactly why, it's because not necessarily that I don't have, I have that lack of being able to communicate that. Does that make sense? I have that lack to be able to communicate it. Not necessarily because I don't have the ability to understand it, right? It's the inability of not being able to communicate it because I don't have that connection. So his brain is aware that he saw the correct saw, that he saw the hand saw, right? But he's just not able to get it to the side of the brain that works. Correct. That is exactly correct. Yes, sir. So imagine now. Keep in mind, the left brain is also in charge of that writing, that reading. So if it's an image or it's a written statement, for example, grapes or oranges or ham whatever the case may be. I wouldn't be able, I will be able to read it. I understand the English language. I can see there's no damage to my occipital lobe, but the problem is I won't be able to communicate that with you. And imagine a case where you know you know something, right? So for example, you know 
Everybody knows what the capital of the United States is. But how do you know that? If I ask you, how do you know that? It's like you probably won't recall who was the first person that told you that in elementary school. It's kind of like that same concept. It's like, you know, you know, you just don't know where it came from, right? Oh, it came from my elementary school teacher, Miss so-and-so, and whatever, right? So it's a matter of don't know that you know, but you do. Because if I asked you what's the capital of the United States, you'd be able to tell me, right? But if I ask you, how do you know that? Well, I, I can't tell you who told me that when I was a kid, but somebody, should, clearly somebody did. Right? Just like clearly somebody showed him an image that he can't tell me where it came from. Just like you wouldn't be able to tell me which elementary school teacher told you that, but you'll be able to, oh, no, it's right here in the back, right here, this word. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. That's kind of like the word like you know the word, but you just can't say it. You know what you want to say, but you just can't say it. Yeah, so think about, if I were to ask you guys, what is thinking? Define thinking, right? That's a really difficult term to define. But I'm sure all of you know what thinking is. What's pride? Really difficult, right? But every single one of you knows what pride means. So you don't have the inability of the language, but it's really difficult to relay that information. So imagine that on a steroid. Because I literally cannot tell you what pride is. I know what it is, but I can't tell you what it is. Any more questions? Does that answer your question? Good deal. Now we have talked an awful lot about neurotransmitters. We have talked a lot about neurotransmitters. But notice that, you know, we talked about serotonin, GABA, things like that. But those are not the only aspects. Those are not the only chemicals that our body utilizes to communicate. And how do we know? Well, it's because we have the endocrine system. This system, this system, I should say, consists primarily of glands. And these glands are responsible for secreting these chemicals. Now notice that these chemicals are referred to as hormones. They're referred to as hormones. So your glands will secrete hormones into your bloodstream. I know someone in, I think it was this class, someone that mentioned, uh, we were talking about the regulation of emotions with previous structures in our brain. And someone mentioned, well, what about uh, females, right? What about, say for example, males and, and testosterone and the role that that plays into emotions, right? And the student brought it up, well, what about females, right? When they're on their menstrual cycle, what impact does that have? But those are not neurotransmitters, are they? Those are hormones, right? So hormones do actually also impact our behavior and also control those functions in your body, right? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, one of the main plants that we're going to talk about particularly as it relates to mental health and behavior, is the pituitary gland. Now, this gland is immensely important. Let's see if I can pull up an image for you guys. Now, this gland is in charge of a great variety of our hormones, and it includes the primary function through these hormones, because remember, it's trying to communicate, right? So those hormones are going to stimulate other aspects of those endocrine glands, right? Because we have cerebral. So for example, um, one that I like to think about is basically when females are expecting or not, they're expecting um, a child, that information will be relayed, basically hormones, letting your brain know you're pregnant, and then your brain saying, oh, you're pregnant. So it sends down that signal to basically start the processing of 
let's say, enlargement of the breast, right? Preparing for lactation, right? So it starts a process, stimulates other glands. For example, memory glands, right? So they can become larger and therefore uh, feed the young. So notice that pituitary gland will indeed have those functions. I'm going to show you an image of that gland. It's immensely small. Uh, and that tiny structure is responsible for many of the hormonal processes that we see in animals. Interestingly, let's talk about oxytocin. Now, in regards to oxytocin, this specific hormone is related by the pituitary gland and it's going to regulate reproductive behaviors, right? So think about, for example, contractions. When a female is giving birth, right? And I should use the term female, not woman. They mean different things, but you're not in social psychology. So that's a topic for another class. The contractions that a female can experience, that happen and that occur because of that secretion, assisting in reproductive behaviors. As I mentioned, the enlargement of the mammary glands, so the pituitary gland sending that signal, you are pregnant, it's time to enlarge your breast so that you can prepare for the young. And this is a fun little, little thing uh, that's been, it's been a, a hypothesis for a while. Oxytocin is also related to controversial, are men are faithful. What? Ooh, I see a lot of eyes all of a sudden. It's like I was half asleep, but I want to listen to that, right? So generally, males who were, let's go back. In research participants, we would spray males with oxytocin, right? With that hormone. And men, or I should say males, who are in the committed relationship, right? What you think about this research, all these men, and they are, quote, in a room with an attractive female as described by now, what is an attractive female? I don't know, but that's what the term they use in the book, an attractive female. I wish they went a little bit more in detail, but anyway. So we have these males, these research participants in a room with a attractive female. They were sprayed with oxytocin, right? And as I mentioned, oxytocin is responsible for reproductive behaviors. Persons. The males who were in committed relationships kept more physical distance between that attractive female than those who inhaled the placebo spray. So men who were in commit, males who were in committed relationship sprayed with oxytocin. They stood and sat further away. I think there's actually a video of that study and it's interesting how to see them like just try to Social distance themselves before social distancing was a thing. Interestingly, another impact of oxytocin in males is that it allows for paternal bonds. For example, the bonds that male, males have with their young, with their children. So it enhances that engagement. So they become more engaged with their children when more oxytocin is present. They tend to relate to the child and engage with the child a little bit more. And this is uh, with males. And you should take this with a pinch of salt because replications of these studies have yielded mixed results, right? So because it has yielded mixed results, we cannot have that type of confirmation just yet, but that's what some of the data suggest. Mm -hmm. You measure like oxytocin and other hormones for like blood tests. Oh yeah, that would be the way to measure. It. Yes, you can. Uh, the question was, can you measure the levels? Yes. Remember, 
neurotransmitters, right, involve the neurons, the communication between neurons, and hormones of that communication through the bloodstream, right? So your pituitary gland, so your reproductive glands, so for example, your testes and your ovaries. So it will do that through bloodstream, whereas neurotransmitters, they do that within that axon central nervous system communication. Now, something immensely interesting about that is that we talked a lot about that aspect, right? We talked about that aspect of neurotransmitters, but keep in mind, hormones do play a variety of functions, right? So we only talked about mainly the pituitary gland, but I want you to keep in mind that we have many different major aspects any different hormones, or I should say glands, that are involved in that process of regulating your behavior through hormones, right? Now, some of you may wonder, and you can evaluate yourselves and say, you know, I act an awful lot like my uncle, or I am nothing like my mom. I, or my siblings, they're super different from me. Or you can say, my little sister is like a clone of me, right? That happens because genetics also have a significant component in regards to our behavior. So generally, we like to think about genetics as, as just my blue eyes, blonde hair, olive skin, whatever the case might be. But this is beyond the surface level. And how is it that we're able to relate to that information? First thing is we need to consider chromosomes. Chromosome. Now, in this regard, think about a thread, right? Think about a fabric of strands of DNA the oxyribonucleic acid. Try saying that five times over, right? And what happens is that your chromosomes are going to carry that genetic information, right? So it's really easy to see it, say, for example, in a physical sense, in an exterior sense, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. For example, I'm mixed race, right? So my dad, uh, my mom was immensely fair skin, and my dad was not. So there's some information that's going to come from each parent, right? 50% from it is going to make little old me, right? So that information extends beyond my appearance. It's going to also extend to your behaviors. But what are genes, right? We hear an awful lot about genes. Very simply put, is that these segments of the oxyribonucleic acid serve as that transmission, right? I want you to think about that data, right? I want you to think about those specific components, right? So when you're writing a code, or for those of you who are artistic, right? You have metaphors, similes, things of that nature. That's what your genes are. They carry that very specific information. They carry that transmission along. Now, most of the time, and sometimes you hear this in popular media, oh, they found a gene related to X, X factor. They found a gene for, say, drug abuse. Generally, that information is misleading because most characteristics are polygenetic. And with poly, polygenic traits, it means that there is more than one pair of genes involved in that trait, in that characteristic. There's usually more than one. Therefore, if most aspects involve the combination of multiple genes, so polygenic, that is why you're not an exact copy of your sibling. Right? Even though they both came from mom and dad, that is why you're not an exact copy. 
because there's multiple genes that played a role. Therefore, for those of you who are interested in math and exponential um, factors, you'll know that there could be exponentially many thousands or hundreds of different combinations that can lead to you and led to your sibling, led to your other sibling. Now, by the same token, the overlap of said characteristics of set genes also explains why you're similar to your siblings, right? For example, both of you are blonde, or both of you have dark eyes, both of you are grumpy. That also explains why there's characteristics that are similar. How do we know the impact how do we know the impact of these genes of hereditary influence? There's three ways that we do such studies. And I'm going to start basically in a different order. We're going to go one, and then we're going to go two and three, probably. We'll see. So is a surprise. So is an adventure in my class, right? We can conduct twin studies. And the purpose of a twin study is that we are going to examine and observe and categorize and distinguish these characteristics that these two individuals have who are indeed genetically identical. And we're going to compare those. So for example, to those of fraternal twins, differences in monozygotic Twins, they are a replica in which they basically split from that same genetic information, that same embryo, the same uh, ovum and sperm fertilization. Whereas with fraternal twins, there were two separate, there were two separate ovums and there were two separate sperm that actually were inseminated in the floor. They're basically siblings, right? It just so happened to be. They just so happen to be fertilized at the same time, and therefore pregnancy occurred at the same time. So they don't share the same exact uh, genetic material, I should say, just like you would in your sibling. The next aspect that I like to cover is that of adoption studies, adoption studies. And we like to see if any relatives, any people who are actually related, we want to see if each of these individuals, how is it that they resemble each other? And why is this important? Well, it's important because with twins, we could argue, say both twins ended up in similar career fields, ended up going to similar colleges or the same college. They ended up um, getting married at the same age or, or both like heavy metal, right? But one can say, well, it has nothing to do with their genes. It has to do with the fact that they grew up together. And that's a reasonable explanation because as we know, nature and nurture, right? Our environment plays a role as to how we develop and so are deep. It's a, it's a good argument. However, we address that with adoption studies because now these family members, these relatives are in different environments, household one, household two. So notice that the genetic material is the same for both cases, but now we have the nature is the same, but the nurture is not the same. So we can understand and ascertain whether or not there was indeed a genetic influence because I can eliminate, eliminate I should say, that variable of nurture. Now we're growing up in different households. Now, the last study that we will talk about today is family studies. Now, with family studies, we're trying to discover, now we're moving to, from that nature side, we're moving towards the nurture side, because now I'm trying to discover what are the similarities between those adopted children and compare them to both their indeed biological relatives 
biological parents and their adopted parents. This will give me an explanation both to nurture and to nature. Are there any questions about that? Good deal. 